So yes, I'm going to talk about ungagging a browser. Um, so why should you listen to the browser? Well, it's in pain. Every day you torture your, your poor little browser. You open up your dev tools every day to debug JavaScript, and it's screaming out in pain, saying, there is so much wrong with what you're doing to me, and we ignore it. So I'm going to show you the, some tools and tricks to listen to it, what it's saying, things like that. So you can consider me your guide for tonight. The uh, information is all there. It's kind of, there's a lot of information. Chrome does a great job of just shoving everything down the pipe to you and saying, you figure it out. I'm not going to help you from here. It's all there. Um, if you don't have much of a traditional computer science background, that can get quite daunting, quite confusing. So I'm going to give you the required prerequisites to be able to dig through this and, and help you out. Uh, the documentation is quite sparse. This is the request timeline documentation. It says, select the timeline drop-down list. You can choose a sorting mode for the network grid here. Fantastic. <laughs> what the hell do all these colors mean? <laughs> yeah. So how am I? Just a little bit of history. At my time at Atlassian, we were given a day a week to work on performance. We contacted a few companies. I'm not going to name them. But they wanted to, to for, for us to get our hands on their tools, we were willing to give them thousands upon thousands of dollars to get our hands on their tools. They were like, yeah, can you sit down with one of our pre-sales engineers? I'll show you how the tool works. Like, I can read documentation. I can waste my own time doing this. I, I just want to give you money. Uh, so we weren't prepared to go through that rigmarole. So I sat down and went and f tried to find what's free out there. I found that Chrome DevTools is the best. It presents the most information. Firefox is catching up, i.e. 9 and 10 is doing a great job now. But today, we're going to focus on Chrome. Uh, so yeah, using the Chrome DevTools, we managed to, we sat down, we looked at what the biggest problems inside uh, Confluence was. We found that the JavaScript was ex executing quite quickly, thanks to Dimitri. <laughs> the rendering was pretty atrocious, but it wasn't a big bottleneck. The thing that we did find was every single network request to, to request a CSS file was taking 800 milliseconds. So we dug into that. We used the Chrome DevTools. We figured out where the, where, the, where the delay was. And we managed to shave that down to about 20 milliseconds across a local network. That was 800 milliseconds on a local machine. So when you add network latency, you can imagine that's going to get into the seconds. And we had about six CSS files. Unfortunately, due to politics, that commit still hasn't landed into the Confluence mainline. <laughs> and that was a year and a half ago. So just before I get into this, uh, a lot of performance talk like to show you graphs and say, if you do it this way, you're going to get a 20% performance increase. This isn't this talk. If you want that, there are plenty of resources that can tell you that sort of information. This is a talk to empower you to be able to dig into your own applications and create those own graphs to go back to your boss and say, look, I can save us 30% of our request time if we do this simple performance optimization. So it, it's, it's all about empowering you to get that information in front of your boss. Um, and so while I have my soapbox, I want to talk about this quote. This quote gets used so many times to put the kibosh on performance optimizations. It's like, we should use this data structure to do this. It's like, that's a premature optimization. A list will do fine. That's bullshit. <laughs> when do you get to choose when your application has to scale? How many times have you woken up the next morning and gone, oh, good. My application has crashed because it's gotten popular. You, you, you don't get to choose when your application has to scale. So you should be designing this. You should be designing your applications to scale from day one. This quote gets a little bit more interesting when you don't take it out of context. What was actually said was, we should forget about the small inefficiencies. So, this, so the small, not the big ones, not those big overarching performance issues like using, using a list instead of a, a, a tree for lookups. It's those small efficiencies. And then it says 97% of the time. So if we then look at the rest of the quote, yet we should not pass up our opportunities in that critical 3%, that quote takes on a very different meaning from what it's used traditionally for today. So yes, I'm going to talk about that critical 3% today. First up is networks. This is a graph of, this is a map of the internet. It's quite big, as you can see. And you could imagine getting a packet from that side of the screen to that side of the screen could take quite a bit of time. So how does a packet get from that side to that side? First, DNS gets involved. 
it says, I, I say, I need to go get to Google. Something that can answer for Google says, I know where Google lives. It lives at this address and passes back an IP address. That, that's two packets across the globe, and all we've gotten is how to connect to that, is, is where to connect to. That's 512 bytes that we've sent across the network, and we haven't, even, we haven't even started talking to that network yet. We've just simply found out where it lives. Then TCP starts up. Does everyone know what the, the TCP three-way handshake is? Hands up. About half of you. So first up, we say SYN, which is saying, I want to create a connection to you. The other pirate says SYNAC. ACK sounds very much like a pirate phrase, right? It's not just me. <laughs> so that says, I acknowledge that your, your request, and now I want to open a connection to you, because TCP is a two-way street. You both send and receive. And then I say acknowledge. So there we've got three packets that have gone back and forth again, all the way across the internet. And we haven't even asked for a website yet. We've just simply said, I've now got a connection open to you guys. So that's a fairly expensive preamble. That's, that's, that's up to six, uh, five packets before we've even sent our HTTP request. So you, you obviously want to limit this as much as possible. Um, there are two ways that we could do this. We could dig into what actually happens. Uh, this is a tool called Wireshark. It's confusing and got a really horrible UI with lots of green and red colors everywhere. Or we could use a network tab inside our browser. Uh, every browser ships with one, well, sort of ships with one. Firefox obviously has Firebug, IE's got a good one, but today we're going to focus on Chrome. Uh. So here's a website you've hopefully all seen before. And I made a request earlier and recorded. So if you just jump to the network tab, hit record, the, this little red button, it's grayed out before. Hit refresh, it will start sending out packets and start recording everything that happens across your network. Uh, you get the status, 200 is obviously good, 304 would be better. Uh, but I've disabled caching here, so it's all fresh. So here's a lot of, it, it gives us a plenty of information about what's happening on our network and, uh, and other such things that we'll dig in soon too. But so DNS lookup, we wasted 67 milliseconds just looking up the network, just looking up where to send the packets. Then that preamble, that SYN, SYNAC, et cetera, took three, 329 milliseconds. Then there was nothing sending. Then, then we were waiting. So we've sent out that packet, and the browser's just sitting here waiting. It's waiting for information to come back. So this could be time spent deep inside your network, uh, deep inside your application. So the more, the more your application is doing on the server side to get this information back, the longer it's obviously going to take to return it to the browser. In this case, it's not too bad. 336 milliseconds with network latency is pretty good. Uh, although it did take 1.28 seconds to receive the rest of that information. So from the time I received that first packet to the time I received the, the, the fin of that, that series of packets, it took 1.28 milliseconds. So that's obviously where I'd start looking, is, is, is why it took so long to receive 100. Because we can't do anything until this first request comes in. So you want to get this first request in as quickly as possible, and then let the browser start doing what it needs to do. So in this case, the browser then requested. Uh, we can tell what made the request. In this case, it's the parser. So the parser is the thing that scans the HTML document looking for things that it has to do. So it hits a CSS file, request a CSS file. So the thing that's interesting to note here is that connecting has now disappeared. Sorry, it was gone. Yeah, so connecting was 329 milliseconds. And now we've got absolutely zero time here. So what the browser's doing behind the scenes here is if we double click on this packet, it sends something called connection keep alive. So this tells the server, please don't do that expensive preamble again. Use that same connection. It, I, it's going to exactly the same address, so you can reuse that connection. So when you've got that HTML page back, reuse that connection. I'll, most of servers out of the box supports this. 
but you want to be checking to make sure that it's actually respecting it. And, here's, and this is a way you can do it. Make sure that on the subsequent request, your connecting is reduced to zero because there should be no packets, there should be no preamble happening. So that's, that's one thing that we can pull out of the network if we close that. The other thing, is it, uh, that's good. The other thing that we can notice is that we've got a ton of requests happening all at once. So this, so rather than having to make wait, so rather than blocking and going, I'm going to sin, sin act, blah blah blah, then I hit another thing, sin, sin act, sin act. So we've solved that problem by using keep alive. But ra but rather than just using one connection, browsers will open up multiple connections to as many hosts as it can. So the more hosts you have the more connections you can open. Up to 25 connections in Firefox, 16 in Chrome 20, and two in IE. You may laugh, but IE is actually the only one that's respecting the HTTP uh, protocol in this request. It says up to a maximum of two requests, except most browser venues said, screw that, that's, that's a ridiculous notion. It's antiquated, which it is. So John, or whoever built this page, has actually done the right thing here. If you notice, we've got a bunch of things on static.webdirections.org, and then we jump to static2. So what this means is because they can only open up to eight connections to a domain, uh, six, between six and eight connections to a domain at once, you want to start thinking about using a CDN to split out your, any, any large object, any large amounts of requests, or a lot of in images, you want to start thinking about splitting them across your CDN so that you can fully ma maximize network th through, through fair. The thing that becomes interesting, though, is we've got this, we've got this fairly straight, consistent line down the page. Uh, damn it. It's not doing it anymore. Uh, so the only time that this, this breaks is when it hits a JavaScript, connect, uh, JavaScript file. So what will happen when you hit a JavaScript file? Because that JavaScript file could potentially be changing the document, it could potentially changing CSS, it has to stop parsing. It has to stop all network connections until that JavaScript is executed. So this is why you get that recommendation to load all your JavaScript after your CSS so the document is continued. Or even better, load it after the parser has done its thing so that everything, all the network requests have come through. The other thing that you may have noticed is there's two vertical lines on the network tab. The blue one shows when the on-dom com on -dom content ready event loaded. This is where modern browsers will generally kick in. The thing that you'll notice is not all images have loaded. So while jQuery will listen this for this for modern browsers, Firefox, Safari, Chrome, et cetera, all, not all your images will have loaded, so that's just something to take care of. However, at 9.23 seconds in, this red line happens, which is the onload event. This is when IE will get that, me the, so in jQuery, you do dollar document ready. This is when IE will get that message, 9.23 seconds after we requested the page. So you need to make sure that any images and things like that, you want to start delay loading them just, just so we can get that JavaScript out and executing as quickly as possible. So that's, that's the network tab. Um, there is one other thing that you should be aware of. Yeah. Some network requests will block. So this means it's in a pool and something's happened. Something's happened so that it, that it's exhausted its sockets. So this is, is trying to make a request, but there's no open sockets for it. Uh, in this case, you want to try shifting it across to a new CDN. Um, so it, it becomes a balancing game of how many sockets do we open versus how many requests we make. So you want to you use this network tab to play around, get things onto CDNs, and just sort of play around and, and fiddle with things until you get that ultimate, u ultimate, ultimate loading time down. Um, again, your, your situation may vary, so just play around, use the network tab to figure that out. Ultimately, you want your page to look something like that in the network tab. It's been absolutely, this is, I can't remember what page this is, but it's made absolutely no network requests. So it's, as it says, it says from case, from case, from case, and it, everything came back in like 24 milliseconds. So this, this means that they've got their cache headers, their cache headers right, everything's, everything's perfect in this case. This is what you want, ultimately what you want your network tab to look like. 
uh, build your site from the view that everyone who hits your site is going to hit it from a cold cache. That means that there's nothing in their cache. There's no network information. The DNS cache is empty, meaning that they've never seen that site before. Build your site under that optimization, but on subsequent requests, you want it to look like this. So what are some things you can do to make that network request look best? Um, so you can defer async on JavaScript. So defer basically says, I've hit a script tag in my head, but I can defer it until the parse is finished loading. Async says, just load it whenever you feel like. There's no determinism when it will load, but it, it will load eventually. The problem being is that you get no guarantee over order. So your dependencies do get a little bit harder to manage there, but you shouldn't have tr dependencies between script tags anyway. Um, cache, check your cache headers, check your cache headers, and then check your cache headers again. Make sure that yeah, they're actually working. They're, the max time to live is, is high. Um, group things that don't change. So your base CSS, generally it's, it's applying layouts and colors and things like that. They're not going to change unless your company goes through a rebrand or something like that. So group them, put a large cache value on them. Then in subsequent files, the things that change regularly, put a lower cache time on those. The same with your JavaScript. Put the unchangeable things, so your base libraries like jQuery and underscore, put them in one file, set a large cache time, and you'll be much happier. Uh, delay loading of things. So move images. If, if images are below the page load and things like that, do things like uh, load them when the, the page starts to scroll. Thing, just anything that you can do to get that in Initial, that initial frame down to a, a, a small size. And obviously, minify and gzip. That's going to reduce your time that it takes to transmit information across the network. So that's the network. That's where I would start looking uh, for, for, for anything performance related. The next thing I would look at is like reflow and repaint issues, but they're covered in depth all across the internet. Paul Irish has a pretty good video on it. Something that I feel that is never looked at is, is memory usage. So the browser stores all its JavaScript on a data, on a, in a data structure called the heap. It's a piece of memory underneath the stack. In JavaScript, we start with a, the global object, obviously the window. We then allocate an object. It's called whatever. We then allocate a property off that object. This is starting to look like Dimitri's graph. We declare another variable, and we declare another property off that other property. So th this is all fairly straightforward. Then we introduce an array. So rather than things being copied around, it simply just starts pointing. Oops. Uh, variables just point. So it's just pointers into other pieces of memory. It, it doesn't copy things into an array. So I've got a. Dimitri said that the easiest way to see that JavaScript has primitives is to write a piece of code. I think he's lying. You can use the heap inspector in Chrome to pull out that information. Much easier. So we've got it fairly. We've got a closure defined there. We've got a small integer. We've got a string which is defined uh, in the literals. We've got a string defined as an object. We've got a concatenated string, and we've got a large int. This is what it all looks like on the heap. Um, so the top one is the closure. As you can see, all the outer variables get copied into its heap object. So this means that every time you create a, 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 a closure. You're actually creating copies of all those outer variables into this closure. So each event handler you add is actually having to copy anything it can access outside that scope into itself. So that could, that, those things are quite expensive. Um, concatenated string is quite interesting. It stores it as two pieces. It doesn't actually concatenate it, concatenate strings together until it actually has to. So what it does is just creates references to the two strings, passes this this cons string throughout the application. So if you never concatenate that string, it never gets concatenated. So you wanna, when you're concatenating strings, don't mutate any of the strings inside the concatenation. Otherwise, it has to calculate it at runtime, which gets expensive. Let the, let the engine do as little work as it can. So we've got my string. As you can see, that's been stored as a literal. It's actually my string. It, it's just stored as my string. And then we've got uh, the other one. Where'd it go? Uh, string constructor. So as you can see, that's now a reference. It says the prototype is string, and then it points to an, an object. That number is just a, an, a reference to something inside V8 heap. It's not a memory location. It's just an, a unique identifier that V8 uses to identify that object. Uh, the other interesting thing is that my small int is nowhere to be seen. This is because of the fact that it's a primitive. It's small. It can fit on the stack, so we don't. it never gets allocated. So knowing that, we can now define what garbage is. So we've got that data structure we saw before. If we start pulling references, 
we're left with this. Now C and D don't, aren't accessed by anything that, what will happen is it will walk from window and just start hitting every object it can see. It has a reference of what has been allocated and then it compares that between what it, what it saw. If it can't see anything, it just simply deallocates those objects. This is how modern browsers do it. I is a little different. It's a little worse. Um, IE, could never, IE could never clean up C and D. It would just be left hanging there. The reason for this is it uses an, uh, an algorithm called uh, reference counting. So it simply, every time, every time you reference a variable, it increments a counter. If that, if that counter gets to zero, it gets cleaned away. Because D is referencing C, that's a count. And because C is referencing D, that, that's a count as well. So when it goes, is there anything at zero, it says no. Even though nothing is ever using it, it, it can't get collected. And that's why you get those famous memory leaks of when you add an event listener to an element, it can never clean up either the event listener or the element because it's got that cyclic reference. So now I'm just going to cover the various garbage collector algorithms that exist out there. Has anyone, does ha anyone here have a, any experience with C or C++? Keep your hands up if you've ever had to use Valgrind. Can you explain your experiences with it? <laughs> Thumbs up. Do you wish you never had to use it, though? <laughs> That's right, but you shouldn't have to use it, right? It, these are the kind of things that programmers shouldn't have to deal with. And these are the things that you don't have to deal with as a, a JavaScript developer, because all the engines implement a, a garbage collector. So the, the algorithm I just described is called mark and sweep. It marks everything in the heap that it can see and then sweeps away anything it can't see. This is what Firefox and IE use as current, although Rob told me yesterday that they've landed a generational and incremental garbage collector in the future. Um, so generational, this is what V8 uses. This is probably what every engine in the future is going to be using. Uh, Java uses it, C Sharp uses it. It's pretty much the future. <coughs> so we allocate objects on the heap. And it gets allocated into a special part of the heap, which is reserved for new objects. The theory of, behind generational garbage collectors is that any time you allocate an object, there, chances are that that object is going to be deallocated in the next garbage collection cycle. So if you think about it, you call a function, you allocate a few objects, you manipulate that function, and then you leave that scope. That object's gone. It, it gets marked very quickly. The things that do survive garbage collection, think of the window, think of like namespaces and things, they're going to they're gonna be around for the lifetime of the application. So they get, they get uh, promoted up into the promotional objects. So we allocate the window. We allocate two functions onto the heap. They get put into the new thing. The garbage collection comes along. And then these two are gone. They were function calls. No need to be around anymore. But the window is long lived, and it gets promoted. That promotion is expensive. You want to avoid it where possible. So that means that you want to watch what you're allocating. You want to make sure that if you're allocating objects inside a tight loop, you're not generating too much garbage. Because what happens is, the more we start to fill up the generational, the, the, the promoted object space, is it now has to do a complete mark and sweep. And what happens when it marks and sweeps is it pauses the entire application. Because if you think about it, if, we delete an app, uh, if we're running the application at the same time we're, we're collecting, if we allocate a new object that points to a reference that we've just deleted, we get kind of weird concurrency errors and things fall over and people scream at you. Um, so what happens here is we pause the whole application and then we have to walk the entire heap. So from the top to the bottom, and that takes time. I've seen garbage collection pauses that last up to 700 milliseconds. So that's nearly a second just with no user input possible. So it's just sitting there doing absolutely nothing. So with that knowledge, what is garbage in, in JavaScript? Any, any allocated object can become garbage. But some things may surprise you. This one's fairly obvious. We allocate something on the heap. We then set it to null. So there's no reference to it. So it gets marked as garbage. This one. This is stolen from a game loop tutorial. This generates every 16 milliseconds a piece of garbage. So that means that every 16 milliseconds, we're something that has to be collected, something for the garbage collector to have to pick up. 
That's because of the, this in, the inner dynamic function here. We're returning this function. It gets executed. It does what it has to do, and then gets thrown out. So anything inside that, that function is then going to get marked for garbage. The function itself gets marked for garbage. And this happens every 16 milliseconds. So you can imagine, we're going to fill up that new promotional space quite soon. I think in V8, it only has a meg to, to use there. So if, if you're generating a lot of garbage inside there, that's going to fill up very quickly. And then objects that shouldn't get promoted start getting promoted up. So you eventually start promoting these functions every 16 milliseconds into the, the top. And that's a very slow process. If you think that's not a real world example, this is the website I stole it from. I apologize if it's, if it's anyone's in here. <laughs> but um, so this, this stuff does it happen. Uh, so to get around that, you, you just want to sort of allocate a function that's going to get promoted once, and then just keep referencing that. This one. Sorry, Dimitri, this is going to answer your question from earlier. So if you remember, Dimitri was talking about why, like, why when you add a property to a string literal, it doesn't get, it returns undefined. Does, has anyone figured out the answer to that yet? One at the back. <laughs> Do you want to tell what it is? The say? You're too far away. <laughs> so what happens here is a, is a concept called boxing. So as, you, as we saw on the, uh, in the heap inspector, it a allocates the, the word string. So there's, there's no object there. There's no reference to anything else out there. So what it does is, implicitly, it calls new string and passes in ABC as the constructor, allocates that object, calls length on that object, and then discards that object. So by calling ABC.length on a literal, we've generated an object that doesn't have to exist. So while, all of the, while this is quite small in itself, just imagine if you were doing this hundreds of times in your application over and over and over again, and you just kept allocating more garbage and more garbage. Internal functions in JavaScript generally return a copy of, sorry, generally don't return a copy, they return a new instance of a string. So in this case, we, we want to get hello out of hello world. We call a.substring. It discards, it calls, it discards a, because we're overriding it. It discards the initial one, calls substring, generates us a new object, and then assigns it to a. So that's another example of garbage inside JavaScript. So it, it's basically any time that you do anything, you're going to generate garbage in JavaScript. <laughs> so memory leaks. Unfortunately, garbage collectors are not perfect. We still leak memory. Uh, as demonstrated by IE, when you allocate DOM objects and uh, assign a, an event listener, get that circular reference, never gets cleared up. Memory leaks like a sieve. Modern engines do much better than IE. It's kind of hard to introduce a memory leak, but it still does happen. Um, so I'm just going to show you how we detect memory leaks how we, and how you go about finding what object is leaking, what still has reference to that object, and how to then fix it. So I, this, this comes from a real example that we discovered while writing Confluence. Um, so we, we loaded a bunch of data from the server. We then added this data to the, the DOM, and we added a click function. It seems fairly innocuous, right? I'm sure you've all written code that looks exactly like this a thousand times before. Then we deleted. If they requested us to delete the entire document, we just cleared out the, the inner HTML. Fairly straightforward. I've put it in a loop just to speed up this leak. The res is really bad. So what we do is we go back to our trusty dev tools. We go to the uh, profiles. We click take heap snapshot. And we take a snapshot before we do anything. Then we start leaking. So what it's doing is it's just looping through and, and calling that function a bunch of times to just speed up the leak. There we go. So now we've inserted a bunch of stuff into the document. 
So you can imagine if this was happening over and over again, this is in a loop, but if it was happening over and over again because of an application. So single page web apps, for example, they sit around for a long time. So if you've got a small leak, that's just going to add up over time, and eventually your application is going to balloon to a gig of memory. Users are going to complain. It's going to chew battery life because the garbage collector is going crazy. Um, so now we delete. Back to profiles. Take another heap snapshot. And as you can see, we've, despite the fact that we've now cleared that out, we've now got more memory allocated than we did before. So there's, there's a few different views that you can look at in the heap. There's a summary, which is absolutely everything inside the heap. Absolutely everything. Things that you won't even, because it allocates everything in the heap, you will see literally everything. So V8 internals, WebKit internals. But so to get through that information, you, you generally want to start from the window because that's where everything that you allocate gets allocated to. But summary view is kind of useless. We want to switch to the comparison view. So what this does, it, it just runs a diff across the two heap snapshots. And as you can see down here, we've got what's called detached DOM trees. So these are, these are DOM references that are still reachable, but they're not visible inside the DOM anymore. So we deleted all these DOM references, but we still have reference to them in our heap. Uh, we loop 500 times. It's quite telling that we've got HTML div elements that have been nude. So that's any, it's created 500 elements, but it hasn't deleted any of them. So that's, that's a good, what, generally what I do when I'm trying to track down a memory leak is I'll, if, it's, if it happens on a button click, I'll click the button 20 times, take a snapshot before, click the button 20 times, take a snapshot after. Then I'll start looking through this comparison view for anything that was allocated 20 times, or roughly around 20 times, because uh, you may miscount. So what we do is we dig through here. We pick any of these. And so down the bottom, we've got this retaining tree. So the retaining tree is, is how, how the heap inspector is still able to get to that object. So if we think back to that graph, it started at the window. We then allocated A. We then allocated B. So C's retaining tree would be B. It would be B, uh, B A and B A window. So in here. We want to drop down element. So there's a function called handle here that's been referenced, which gives us a sort of starting point as to what we should be looking at here. This says to me that jQuery is allocated a handle. It's still got reference to that handle. So we're weaking there. This was actually a perfect storm of events because jQuery also, when you call data, which is called within the binds of an event, it caches that element just to speed up lookups. So just to. So as you can see, it's something related to jQuery. It's something related to an event. So we go back to the code. So we've got a closure here. And as, as you saw before, when a closure is allocated, everything in the heap is allocated into that closure. So what's happening here, because we, we're referencing text inside our event handler, and because that's getting copied into the cache, we've got this sort of circular dependency between the jQuery cache, this, this closure, and so it never gets cleaned up. So the way we fix this was quite simple. There are, there, are, there are a couple of ways you could have fixed this, but we chose one way because we couldn't remove the closure. You could remove the closure so it removes that, that out object getting allocated in, in, with the in, in with the cache. That will clean it up. But the other thing we did was just simply, every time we allocated an object into the, into the, do the document, we put it into an array. This is going to increase memory a bit, but performance work is all about trading off, um, what, taking one trade off and, and speeding up another thing. So if you think, think of a cache, that, that the whole purpose of a cache is to increase memory usage, but increases lookup time for you. So you've got to make these, you've got to make these judgment calls on what you're going to trade off to get, and is it worth the benefit that you get? And then simply, we then just call, when we deleted the data, we just simply loop through and call remove. And this, this forces jQuery to c clear up its cache. This then makes sure that it's no longer leaking. So that's how you fix and detect a memory leak. Is everyone clear on that? Was that straightforward enough? Cool. How long have I got, by the way?
You can also get this information through the console. If you start up Chrome with dash dash enable memory info, there's an object called, that will then appear called console.memory. And this will give you heap size, uh, allocated size, and the usage of that. So you can now put this into your continuous integration servers and start getting real-time memory stats of your browser to see if you're increasing memory over time. Uh, CPU profile. JavaScript obviously runs on the CPU. So you want to see how fast, how much CPU it's using, where all your time is going. Oops. Chrome, again, has the best one. So I've got this. It's a list of the periodic table of elements. And I've just written a simple search function. So while, while I loop through, and while list of something, and while the, I just get the nth child increment a counter, I get the item out of the DOM, I then check the text, I check if the text is equal to the thing I'm looking for, then I increment the count, and then I return the found item. Who here has written code like this? Oh, come on, Fritz. <laughs> You're all lying. I see code like this all the time. And as we'll see, this is absolutely horrible. So if we go back to our trusty DevTools, we go back to our trusty Profile tab, we take a, we start the application, we start the profile, it's now, V8 does it in such a way that it won't have large impact inside your application. Um, so it's now just collecting information on it running. As you can see, it's taking quite some time to run. It's still going. We'll stop that there. So there's two columns here, self and total. Self is how much time it took executing code within that function and within that function itself. Total is, if you, you very rarely enter a function and don't call out to other functions. So total is the amount of time it took to, to do that whole tree of, of function calls. So, and garbage collection also features quite heavily here. So if we walk down here, we can see that start, so I call start when I click that start button. It then calls find element, and calls e function init, which is a JavaScript function, and then e find, which is a sizzle function, and then it falls down to query selector all. So 11 seconds of our time was spent pulling elements out of the DOM. This should tell you something, that DOM access is really expensive. And generally, every time I profile, it's DOM access that appears in this profile, profile tab. So with that knowledge in mind, knowing that DOM access is expensive, how can we rewrite this? So before we had, it was pretty inefficient. We looped through the DOM, and we just kept pulling LIs off until we didn't have any LIs left. We then re-looked up that exact same selector to pull off the, and how many of you do that? How many of you write dollar something, and then the very next line, dollar something? One of you is honest. So we rewrite it with that in mind, that knowing that do not ever take to an optimization without getting metrics first. You do not want to start thinking that something's the biggest problem, because you'll be often surprised that it's not the biggest problem inside your code base. Network generally is the biggest thing that you hit. But anyway, we've obviously found a, a problem. So we've rewritten it. I've implemented the cache, knowing that it costs something to look up things on the DOM, so we're going to avoid that. We're going to shove it into a cache. So now, if cache name, we just simply return. We don't have to hit the DOM even once. We then store away in a global variable. I know that's bad, but you know, it's a demo. We then store away the global variable, the list, so we only ever have to look up that list once. The only DOM access we now have to do is when we're looping through that list to, to, to search things off. But again, we only have to do that once per, per item in the periodic table. So we jump back to my browser, run this again. That's, that's it. Before I had time to go to the Profile tab, open up the CPU profiler. If we were to profile that, I can't really do it. If we were to profile that, you would see that none of our code actually appears on the profiler anymore. It's all garbage collection and things like that. So yeah, never take to an optimization blind and use the tools that you've got. Um, again, this information is available programmatically, console.profile, console.profile.n. So you, a, a tool that we wrote at Atlassian, which we're, I'm, I'm hoping will get open source soon, 
use WebDriver to pull this information out of a console. So we'd perform a bunch of deterministic actions, start the profiler, click a button, do, it, do a few things, and then stop the profiler. We would then parse that, that, that tree, just walk the thing, and look for any function that was taking more than a set, set threshold. So if it was taking more than 200 milliseconds, because JavaScript is single-threaded, that means it's blocking the browser. That means there's 200 milliseconds, and 200 milliseconds is about the time your users get pissed off because they can't do anything. Um, so if it took more than 200 milliseconds, we walk back up the tree, found the callee, and mark that for, for op needing optimization at some point. It, uh, I left before we actually put this out, but apparently this has saved developers so much time. So I, I, I implore you to go out there and write something like this. It was simple. Now we get to my favorite topic, JavaScript engines. I'm going to talk about V8, because that's the only one I know. Your mileage may vary. Most modern engines do very similar things to what V8 does. Uh, where I can, I'll point out the differences. AST, Jed covered this, so I don't think I need to cover it again. IR, IL. IR is intermediate, intermediate representation, and it's, or IL is an intermediate uh, language. So you can think, think bytecode, think like the Java bytecode. It's something Java gets turned into bytecode and then gets executed on the virtual machine. This is how Firefox works. This is how J the JSC core, JavaScript core inside Safari works. V8 does some things a little differently. It has a product called Crankshaft. It has no bytecode. It has two compilers. The first compiler is completely naive. It goes directly from an AST into JavaScript, uh, sorry, into assembler. And it does it very quickly. It makes no uh, assumptions about your code. It just gets assembler out. Because if you think about it, a lot of JavaScript doesn't get run more than once. It loads a page, does a few things, and that's it. So with this in mind, V8 now only optimizes when things get hot. That's when the second compiler kicks in. And what it does is it generates a second language called Hydrogen. It, makes, it runs through that, checks types and things like that, makes optimizations based on that, turns it into another language called Lithium, which they then al allocate all the registers on the CPU and do that well. And then they turn it into native code. They do this all while your code is running. So it will hit a function, optimize it, replace the function, and you won't even notice that you've now entered a new function of optimized code. I don't know how they do it. I like to say it's wizardry. And I'm pretty sure that those guys in Belgium wear wizard's hats. Um, yeah. So how does it do these optimizations? So on the first pass through this, it, do, it does something else. It creates what's called intermediary caches. So just like Dimitri was showing this morning, when you create a prototype, it creates this invisible class that you can't see. V8 creates another one, which is called the intermediary cache. And it keeps the shape of the object in memory. So the shape of the object is how many properties it has, what, what the type of those properties are. It then stores a quick jump into those properties. So, you, so it can actually do in two instructions a lookup and a, and a jump to that property. If you then mutate that shape, it then has to load in a slow cache and has to look up in a hash table where to get that information and it's much more instruction. So the information we can glean from this is do not mutate shapes of objects. So when you allocate a new object, make sure all the properties defined up front and even if you just null them out, this is going to mean that V8 can optimize your code much quicker. Then the JavaScript starts running. If your function becomes hot at any point in time, meaning it thinks that it's due for optimization, it will do what's called an optimistic optimization. This means it takes all the type information that it saw. So if you kept calling the function with ints every single time, it's going to then generate you a function that's fantastic at dealing with ints. However, if you violate that trust and if you suddenly put a string in, it then has to stop, de-optimize. It actually literally de-optimizes, puts in new code, and then starts running this process all over again. It then does inlining. So if, if a function is small enough, and it can just put it in, into the caller so that it doesn't have to set up the function, doesn't have to put all the arguments on the stack and things like that, it will do that. It will just, so if you've got a function that's just x plus y, it will literally just put x plus y into the code rather than having to call that function. And it does loop invariance. One of the biggest arguments that used to happen in the JavaScript community was, do you have to cache your variable, uh, your R array length inside a for loop? That's a loop invariant. So if you never change the, the array length, V8's just going to inline that as, an, as a number. So if, if your array length is 8, it's literally going to shove 8 into that for loop. So unless you're dealing with DOM elements, you don't have to cache your, uh, your length anymore. I'm going to show you a few things that V8, you can get information out of V8. 
You can also get this information with, out of Chrome. If you start Chrome with JS flags equals a string, and then the arguments I'm just about to show you, then you can get um, all this information out of a running Chrome uh, browser as well. Or they had one open. There we go. So I've got a very simple function. It has a It just loops and adds a bunch of numbers. We've got a very small function, like I described before, so you'd expect this to be inlined. Except I'm going to introduce a side effect. So something that, so a side effect is something that happens simply because that function was called. So in this case, usually what you want is the function input to be the function and, and then only have output. So you don't want it to go off and change a global variable. In this case, you don't want it to go off and print. V8 can't optimize this. So how can we tell that V8 can't optimize this? If we, I've compiled a debug version of V8, and now if we put an argument called trace inlining, add.js, it's going to run. Oops. Why didn't that print? There we go. So V8 no, notice that this function's hot, and then it says did not inline print called. It says do not did not inline print called from add target not inlineable. So this tells us that it couldn't. That simple function was tried to be inline, but it can't inline it, and it, it gives us a reason why. Um, let's see if we. I can never remember the. If we then grab the source. It gives us a list of things that it can't it, it can't inline. So target AST is too large. The one thing that I find interesting is this first one: target text too big. So it's taking text size of the function in. So if you put your if you put your comments inside your function, it can't inline it. I don't know why, <laughs> but that's just one thing to keep in mind: put your comments outside the function. Um, target is recursive. Inline depth limit reach. So there's a bunch of reasons here that it can't do it. The, the, our one was simple. We now go to add. Take out print. Uh, it won't be hot anymore because so we just increase the limit. Run it again, and here we go. Inline add called from loop, so it's in inlined it. Increase uh, that. So another thing that V8, as I said, it, it performs optimizations when the functions get too hot. So we can now we can trace that. Oops. So we can trace that that op that optimization. It's not going to bail out anymore. Okay. So we can trace that uh, what what functions are being optimized, what functions aren't being optimized. Um, so in this case, add was optimized uh, for recompilation. Small function ICs were uh, ICs with type information. So that means that it's being called with an int every single time. If we increase this a bit more. I uh, checked out a new version of V8, and it seems to have fixed a bunch of things. So the other thing that V8 will do is, it, when it, it will, if a function gets marked hot, it will try and optimize it. But the thing is, it will bail out um, here. So bail out in hgraph builder in, call to JavaScript runtime function. So it's, it's tried to optimize an internal function called in, but it can't because it's got a JavaScript runtime function. So it's something it has to call out into uh, JavaScript land for. We can then trace these again. So too many clauses in a switch statement, it, we won't be able to optimize it. Function calls a val, but even more reason never to call a val. Uh, with statement, uh, there's also try catch. Uh, so things like try catch with something that can modify scope is going to bail out V8's optimization. So you want to try and avoid those. 
Uh, something that Eric Corey from the V8 team recommended to me is if you do have to use try catch for whatever reason, put that into another function, and the, hot fun the, the function that gets marked hot just calls out to that, and so it can still get optimized while still having the benefit of try catch. Um, so with the optimization, it said small function ICs with, with type info. Um, for some reason, it's not bailing out anymore. Oh, that's why. So as I said before, as I showed you before, V8 does weird things with integers. It calls, stores them on the stack. So what happens here is V8 watches our function. It watches that add function, and, and we call it with ints eight, a thousand times. So it then goes, OK, I can optimize this. I'm going to make you an add function that adds ints very quickly. But then something happens. We cross that 2 to the 31. So 2 to the 31 is about the limit of where it will start to having to allocate it on the heap. So uh, you can see here, it's marking loop for optimization. It's then optimizing it. And then it marks loop for optimization yet again. So what's happening there? So we can now, this is where things get a We then uh, call with trace dopt and comment codes. Uh, we then get this nice chunk of assembler put out. You don't really need to know anything about that, but what you do want to look for is this, this, these three semicolons and deferred code stack check. So this, this, tells us, this tells us the instruction that it bailed out on. So what V8 does is every time you call a loop, every time you call a function, it, inc it includes an instruction called stack check. What this does is allows you to place a debugger. It allows it to de-optimize. It, it, it basically allows V8 to take control of that executing code and do what it needs to do. So if you, s if you start seeing things like stack check appearing in the de-optimization information, generally what you want to do is look where you're violating trust. You can, you, if you really want to learn hydrogen, you can trace the hydrogen output, and it will show you the, uh, um, the type information that it expected. Um, I wouldn't recommend that. I would just simply read your code and figure out what's going on. So in this case, as I said, we were calling it with ints. We then generated a function that was good at dealing with ints. We then crossed that 2 to the 31 barrier. It bails out. So one thing you can do, I wouldn't really worry about this, is you can tell V8, allocate this, this number on the heap straight away. We call it again, and we only optimize once. And that's how you use free tools to run performance optimizations. Any questions? <laughs>